For a long time now, I've been working behind the scenes to perfect what I think might be my dream dress. It's simple and classic in its lines, with a full skirt and compressive bodice. It's versatile and easy to style. It's pretty straightforward to sew. It's fully finished inside and washes well. It suits a wide variety of fabrics and a lot of easy customization options. And, conveniently, it's readily available in many bookstores. It also happens to be about 450 years old. This is the basic Henrician Tudor Kirtle from the Tudor Tailor, one of the best historical costuming books ever published, in my humble opinion, and probably my favourite dress I've ever made. I will say at this point that my construction methods are very definitely modern and aimed towards using a sewing machine. If you want a more historical method, follow the instructions in the book. The journey of creating this goes back several years to when I made a red corduroy kirtle for a witch costume. I very responsibly sized up the pattern, rescaled it to my measurements, and then didn't make a mock-up. So the final dress didn't fit. I've still got that bodice, so you can see just how bad it was. Thus the quest began, and so I made a bunch of refinements to the pattern and moved on to another dress in a printed cotton broadcloth, where I tried a bunch of different techniques, and uh, I'm not going to get into everything that went wrong with this one, but suffice to say it was a lot, and yet it still turned out basically wearable. I did have to lightly gust it at one point, but you'd hardly tell. Then I made further adjustments, including fixing whatever had gone wrong with these straps. Spoilers, I'm still struggling with these straps. And made an unboned version out of an offcut of black fabric that I thought was something like denim. And that was pretty good. I had to put less in the skirt than I usually like, but it was comfortable and very wearable, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I felt able to move on to some fabric that I actually cared about. That was this Halloween print quilting cotton, and while I was extremely happy with how the structure of the bodice came out, I went back to my original boning pattern and it works really well, very happy with the dress overall, it was weirdly kind of big on the waist, which didn't make any sense because the unboned black version fit perfectly. And as you can probably tell from the lining here, that black fabric shrinks. I actually can't wear this dress anymore because it shrinks every time I wash it and it's now too small. However, I was confident enough, based on this penultimate dress, that I set out to remake the bodice of the red kirtle, producing probably the best dress I own, and of course, allowing me to film the long-promised revised kirtle video- no, wait, scratch that, I completely forgot to film it. Which, clearly, meant I needed to make another one. Which I did! I made this green wool kirtle, where again I tried another construction method, which did not at all work. There's a video about this one, and I even made this petticoat loosely based off the same pattern, and I started another project, which you'll probably get to see eventually, but boy have I not at all worked on that in over a year. All of which is to say, clearly, I needed to make another one. So here we are at last, the climactic kirtle video to end all kirtle videos. Or at the very least, the video that will get it out of my queue so I can go back to make a hundred more of these in my own time, in private, not worry about filming it. The pattern revisions here weren't terribly severe, but are worth spending a quick moment on. If you look at the original bodice, it's too big width-wise, it's too long for my torso height-wise, the straps don't line up, and the armholes are not really in the right place. I ended up taking some length off the bottom, reducing the width all around. The fit I like is very snug, particularly around the chest, so if you're making this pattern, yours may be more curvy and relaxed. And also making some substantial changes to the armholes. My shoulders roll forward and I have a broad back, so the entire front strap got cut off and moved towards the centre front by a half inch or so. I lowered and deepened the front armhole, but then also on the back I made the armholes much shallower. The width and height was, I think, operator error in resizing the pattern according to my measurements. The armholes and straps, however, is something I copied straight off the pattern from the book, so definitely something to look out for if you don't have ramrod straight historical posture. 
One of the things I really like about this pattern now I've made it a few times, I know exactly how much fabric I need. Three and a half meters of the outer fabric as standard, of which half a meter makes my bodice, so if I have less than three and a half meters, I'm going to be compromising on skirt fullness or length. For very thick fabrics like this wool blend, that's not always a bad thing, but generally for most mid-weight fabrics like the quilting cotton I'm using here, three and a half meters is the goal. Then I usually need about half a meter of lining, some scraps for reinforcement, and a few notions. This dress is very easy to cut out, you just need two fronts and two backs in the lining and the outer fabric, plus an extra reinforcement layer if you want it. For the skirt I usually just tear straight across for three one meter lengths of fabric. You don't have to do this step, but I really like it, because I usually am just working with two layers of lightweight cotton. I stitch a reinforcement layer, ideally something like linen, but another cotton is also fine, to the inside of the front bodice lining, just on the body pieces, and usually not extending into the seam allowance or the straps. Usually I just do a grid or simple pattern, but this time for some reason I decided I was going to follow the spider webs on the lining. I don't know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It took forever. As far as main construction, first I'm going to sew the outer together, centre back and both side seams. Then I'm going to sew the lining together the same way, stack them right sides together before sewing all around the front, neckline and armholes. Leave the bottom edge and the top of the straps open. Clip your corners. Don't be too aggressive on your centre front points, as there will be a bone there, and while you want to be able to turn that corner out nicely, I found this is the first place that wears through. Turn it out and press it. Next we're going to add boning channels, which you can skip if you prefer a softer fit. I really like the support of the boning and the way it keeps the bodice super flat, and using the kind of boning advertised as synthetic whalebone is still pretty comfortable. 
I usually go for two bones about an inch apart on either side of the front to support the lacing, two bones either side of the centre back seam, and sometimes one in each side seam, it depends how I'm feeling. I mark these channels on the inside, but top stitch through both layers with a thread that matches the outer. Then I cut the bones to size and file them down to avoid points. Don't be tempted to make the bones too long. You're going to turn up the bottom of the bodice in a second, which will shorten the channels. And if the bones are too big, they'll wear through your outer fabric, regardless of how well you filed them down. I like the plastic because I can just use a nail file. To finish the bottom edge neatly, I top stitch a ribbon from the outside. Sir, sir. As I was saying, to finish the bottom edge of the bodice neatly, I top stitch a ribbon along the outside, hanging off the bottom edge. I'm going to flip the bodice over, turn the ribbon up to the... Sir, this is outrageous behaviour. I'm going to turn the ribbon up and hand stitch it to the lining, covering the raw edges and stabilising the bottom of the bodice ready for the skirt. I still haven't found a good way of sewing the shoulder straps together, but I can say that tucking all of the seam allowances into the back strap does seem to give the cleanest edge. I always finish these by hand as nearly the last step on the bodice. Finally, the bodice needs eyelets. I like to do hand-sewn eyelets in a crisscross pattern. I don't have a set number, I just eyeball what I think looks nice. I have done other closure methods before, but the lacing, while wildly inconvenient, is still my favourite. I split embroidery floss into two lots of three strands to make my eyelets, which is apparently not the best. Embroidery floss isn't very strong, but it's worked out fine for me so far and I always have it on hand, so finding a matching colour isn't too hard. You just poke a hole with an awl and then work around it with a few stitches to keep it open. You don't have to overthink this step. You can literally take three or four stitches and the eyelet will stay open. Then we're on to the skirt. I usually use whole panels widthways, so the self edge of the fabric is at either side of each skirt panel, and it doesn't need to be finished. The ideally three, maybe only two skirt panels get sewn together along the sides, except for whichever side it's going to be the centre front, in which case I leave the top six to eight inches open. Yes, this does unfortunately mean you have to wear an underskirt, long shirt or apron, but I would still rather have a centre front closure. At this point, I usually hem the bottom, and I'll also run the top edge through the overlocker. If you don't have an overlocker, a zigzag or something similar is also great. This will be so invisible on the final garment. Don't stress about it being nice or spend a lot of time in finishing it. I press a fold to the inside into the top of the skirt, like I'm going to do another hem, but instead this time I will start running threads for cartridge pleats. I use a strong thread doubled. I do at least two parallel lines of gathering threads and I do each panel separately. What I don't do, which we'll see in almost every tutorial, is measure. As long as the stitches are roughly the same size and the two parallel lines match up, that is they go in and out more or less along the same line, it looks 80% as good as the meticulously measured ones and for 20% of the effort.
Don't get me wrong, measuring carefully will get you a more perfect result, but this is anywhere between three and a half and four and a half meters of gathering. That's going to take so long. Once all the threads are in, you can start gathering the pleats down, which always seems like it should be far more satisfying than it actually is. Be gentle with those threads, they're very annoying to replace if you snap one. I make sure to mark the centre back of the skirt if it's not obvious, and line that up with the centre back seam of the bodice, on the outside. The on the outside part is important. Then I also line up the fronts and roughly distribute the gathers. They're so dense that if there are some wiggles, it doesn't matter too much. Starting at the back, I whip stitch each point of a gather to the bodice, usually going over twice and going through the ribbon binding if I can. That works fine for straight edges, but as you've probably noticed, my bodice goes down to a point in the front and I've got a straight skirt. In theory, I could work out some kind of slope in the top of the skirt, but honestly, that all sounds very complicated to me. You might find that an easier prospect, in which case I welcome you to taper the top edge of your skirt. But if, like me, you're cutting straight across, once the bodice starts going into a point, you'll want to flip the skirt to the inside so you can keep whip stitching it to the lining, but maintain your straight line. This does make the front a bit bulkier than it would be otherwise, but honestly, I've been fine with that. And that's it! On a good day, I can make one of these kirtles in a weekend. I have a bunch of variations I want to try out, and a lot of fabric specifically with which to do so, so I anticipate making many, many more in future. You can very easily move the closure to the sides or back, make a more cropped renaissance style bodice, try out different pleating patterns or lengths of skirt, and add all kinds of embellishments. These totally pass as modern, retro, or cottagecore pinafore dresses, but also make a great basis for LARP and historical costumes. Also, as a bonus, there's loads of other amazing patterns in the Tudor Tailor, and a great deal of interesting information. I highly recommend checking it out. And let me know if you make one. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram to see pictures of my cat and down in the description box you'll find A, my new PO box. I don't know how long I'm going to keep it active for, but it exists at time of upload. And B, a link to my Ko-fi page where you can make a one-off or reoccurring donation to support this channel and probably at least 16 further kirtles. Ko-fi supporters get early access to all of my content and I couldn't do what I do without their help. Dream big, and I'll see you next time.